I, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, it's bizarre. It's all, it's all kind of, yeah. Anyway, I was thinking about Monday when you said, have you got a date that we can do this? And I was like, oh fuck, I'm in such a dark place right now. <laughs> what kind of a conversation are we gonna have? <laughs> It's okay to be in a dark place. Uh, yeah, you know, that's that's the reality. Anyway, I'm normally I'm very buoyant, which is um, a good thing and allows me to do the work I'm doing that I think uh, it's just, you know, sometimes being bullheaded and buoyant that allows me to keep going forward yeah. when others would give up. But um, yeah, anyway, it's the, all of that is really being tested and it's uh, the air quality here is so poor right now like I had four days where I just couldn't open my door at all which puts me in a concrete shoe box that's 500 square feet as my live workspace and you know I have a balcony that's really large and is covered so that's actually been my workspace for since March through all of this. And then of course we've got the two parks that I work out of. So I've been really privileged through all of the pandemic of having this, these gardens to be tending and an outdoor workspace that's private to be in and uh, all of that was just kind of taken away. And you realize how much air quality is something when you have it you take it for granted. It's kind of like when my back isn't sore, I just take having a healthy back for granted. And yeah, now suddenly not having that air quality is, um, it's a wake up call. And certainly through the pandemic of having, you know, everything then reduced that much more in what's possible, um, being able to just be emotionally functional is that much harder, right? Our capacity is just tested. Anyway, I, so now I've taken to every time I pour myself a glass of water, I'm just giving gratitude to the fact that I have potable water and hot water on demand by turning a faucet because we take that for granted here and we shouldn't because not everybody has that. So yeah, anyway, it's, it's hard. It's hard times. It puts everything yeah. in perspective. I'm in Colorado right now and it, it's a little smoky today, but we, it was, I was on the Colorado trail all summer and we had a, a week or two where up in the high country, you couldn't see the mount, you know, see that far it was pretty smoky but it still was nothing compared to like I don't know why it just ha isn't we had a bunch of fires here and then this big snowstorm knocked everything out which was great but yeah it hasn't been unbearable and I've experienced that like one time actually in Hood River at our free, uh, mutual friend Aaron's place there was yeah. a fire like right down the canyon uh, like the gorge from there a couple years ago and I was at her cabin and we were like inside her cabin like what do we do <laughs> it's so smoky it's terrible <laughs> so uh, I had never experienced that until then and then I felt all anxious and I realized that that smoke does that too you know yeah and it's and it's interesting because all through the pandemic there has been this kind of heaviness and this you know existential weight shall we say that um I and many others have been kind of feeling um in a in a intellectual and an emotional way and now suddenly i'm feeling that as well on a physical level like that's and it's that it's interesting trying to have that uh you know how do you kind of tease out what you're feeling what is actually the physical response and what is the emotional response to what's happening and and then of course it's like I'm coughing, my throat is sore, my nose is stuffed up. Do I have COVID, right? Like there's that whole other <laughs> kind of, <laughs> which, oh my God, yeah. So anyway, here we are, yeah. Cultural anxiety on top of physiological anxiety yes. and then the more Yeah, yeah, anxiety. it's just like, what, what's next? And it's, and it's that like, yeah, like I, I um, have been, getting the New York Times, um, uh, subscribed to the New York Times uh, a year and a half ago, I guess, when things uh, stateside started to really go off track uh, as, as we predicted with your current um, government. And so um, I've just, you know, I've been like way more of an American news junkie 
than I really want to be. And myself and so many others that I know in the UK, throughout Canada are like, when is he going to be gone so we can have those two or three hours of our lives back of where we're paying attention to what's happening in your government? You know, <laughs> you know. anyway, it's like waking up and not being able to stop myself. It's like this bad compulsion now, this bad relationship that I keep going back for more and those notices keep coming into my inbox. Like, what did you do today? And I keep clicking and reading and it's like, why am I still doing this to myself? Anyway, so I have taken to having a couple of days a week where I just don't allow myself to read the news and I don't go on social media and I just, um, kind of present in my own world and with the people I see mm -hmm. on that day and my friends, whatever, but it's like, no, no social media, no, um, yeah, no news. But uh, yeah, it is this kind of weird, dysfunctional, um, uh, obsessive relationship that is not, not good, but some, you know, but at the other hand, it's like, I feel this need to stay somewhat informed of what's going on. But uh, yeah, how do you how do you do that and then still function within your own life is kind of the the juggle, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Spring when the pandemic hit, I was in rural New Mexico, basically in the wilderness, and there was no cell service unless I went to town. Silver City was the closest town, and so I would do that one day a week, <laughs> and it was kind of Lit. crazy. Yeah. It was like, or or I had to bike up this mountain and I would get two bars, you know, but it would, I had to work to get to that spot, you know, and I yeah. would always feel really crappy at the end of that day. And then I had another six, five or six days until the next time. And I really noticed how I felt like that, pre that anxiety I was observing other people have like on overdrive, I was just having more like one or two days a week instead of every day, all day. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 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 And trying to just kind of keep that in check somehow. Um, and it, you know, it, it's the conversation each of us has to have with ourselves in terms of what does the, the most good, how much can we take in and still function and be positive and be supportive in our own immediate worlds where we're more able to make a difference and support others and, um, yeah, a friend um, that I work with, uh, Lori Snyder, um, who is a herbalist and an um, amazing skill holder, uh, Métis background, um, she and I were talking about this and she was like, Sharon, don't, don't beat yourself up for unplugging. I've had conversations with elders that I talk with who have said to me, absolutely, it's important that there are people out there that are able to stay buoyant and uplift and hold that space for others. And um, if, if being unplugged from that daily grind uh, is what allows it, then that's, that's what you need to do. But you know, maintaining buoyancy is super important at times like this. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's something for that. And I think you know, each of us has to answer for ourselves what is our best place to be in terms of the multiple calls to action that are required right now. And there are multiple ways of responding and being, um, being present and supportive and helpful, whether you are a frontline worker, whether you are a frontline protester, uh, whether you are um, keeping your head down and just doing good work that's supporting others. Um, yeah, there's multiple ways that we can, uh, be on the side of good, right? Be, the, be kind of, um, yeah, I don't know. I could start crying now though, as I think about it. Anyway, that, but we each have to have that conversation for ourselves of what can we do? Um, and it's gonna be different for everyone. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think about like, if I was physically, but maybe back in Virginia where I grew up, I would probably be more, would have been more involved in like, protests with the confederate statues and things like that but like right now I'm in rural Colorado there's like a different set of fields that I can touch here you know and then I have yeah. a test project which is much more like everywhere I can it can reach everywhere but I can still be where I am you know yeah and I'm like okay well I'm not going to drop everything right this second and go to Virginia and like do that I don't think I can energetically <laughs> right now yeah know? yeah 
And, but in this place, I can continue to do what I've been doing. You know, I did a podcast actually a couple of years ago about why the statue should go down, or at least it was like a conversation, a big part of the conversation I had with a friend of mine, you know, it's like, okay, well, it's like, I'm doing what I can where I am with what I have, you know, and I'm, that was an yeah. awakening, you know, realizing I can't be everywhere and do everything and hold it all because I don't have, I'm not the kind yeah. of person that has that endless energy. So we all just like, yeah. Oh, we have our gifts and we have to figure out how to continue to yep. like trust yep. that, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Well, let, I want you to um, introduce the audience to a little bit of your pra your art practice because you're an artist and a craftsperson. And then um, also, yeah, speak a little bit about how you mix art and craft because I think that's really interesting. A lot of people keep that as separate worlds. At least I've noticed that in my own like yeah. traveling in like the art world and the craft world. And I really like how you kind of do a lot of things that merge that. So yeah, introduce yourself and your work and then how you merge those worlds together in your work. Sure. Uh, so um, my name is Sharon Callis and I'm here in the place we call Vancouver. British Columbia, and I live on the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish, the tsleil and the Musqueam people, and it is in the Coast Salish language basin, and um, I've been here since 92. I grew up in Ontario and uh, moved out for art school to go to Emily Carr in 1992, so I've been out here for quite a while now. This is definitely home. Um, my background is coming from many generations, Canadian uh, settlers um, coming from Wales and Scotland and Ireland and Germany, England. Um, and my family over multiple generations back to like, you know, loyalists that were given land in New Brunswick because it was cheaper than sending them back to Britain after the American <laughs> War of Independence. Um, so my, uh, family has, um, moved from one province to another province, um, or state to another state or province, mostly through Canada. Uh, so I, I don't have a strong sense of connection to place beyond the family home where I grew up in, uh, suburbs, a uh, very middle-class, um, suburban lifestyle in a very white community. Um, and moving out here, I was really struck, if I think back to when I first moved out here, I was really struck by how many people that I saw out here that were not white, which was actually a really interesting. I remember being on a bus and having this sense of relief um, looking around at how many people there were with different skin colors to myself and different clothing and it was just this very multicultural experience that I looked around and it just it was like oh like it, I, I remember sighing like it felt right it felt somehow there was a balance <laughs> just being on this public bus going from Richmond when I, where I was living at the time to school one morning uh, but also seeing so many indigenous people uh, on the streets um, and around, which you did not see at all in the city that I grew up. And, um, you know, growing up in school, we learned about First Nations and it was this kind of past tense uh, story that we were told. And it, um, it was a really interesting reframing for me to learn what unseated even meant. The fact that I'm living on land that the peoples whose land we're on, they never signed anything. This is not a treated area. Uh, so that was something that was new to me. So there were just all kinds of discoveries that I started kind of making and really changing the story for me about my own family history, my own sense of place and connection to that place and um, just trying to kind of unpack where I fit into all of that. Um, and I didn't, you know, it's still hard to kind of find words to that to an extent. I certainly didn't have the, the language um, to put to it at the time. And that would have been, you know, I was in my early twenties 
but um, yeah, so I went to art school and um, graduated from art school in 96 and I didn't have a lot of money. Um, I'd managed to put myself through art school without uh, student loans. And I, so I graduated debt free, which was massive. And I was very clear on the fact I did not want to be a commercial artist. Um, I've, um, I didn't have uh, any interest as I, I wasn't, I didn't identify as a consumer. And so I didn't feel like it made sense to be creating artwork that fit within a consumptive system. And I didn't really know what all that meant. I was just very clear on what I didn't want to be without necessarily knowing what the alternative was. But I understood enough to know the economics of the fact that if I was not going to sell the work I was making, there was no logistical or economic feasibility in buying the materials that I was going to be using in that art practice. So um, I, I just felt like it was really important to start looking at what was free and how could I obsessively and compulsively change things that I was finding in my world for free and make beautiful and interesting things. And when art school in the early 90s, um, the handmade aesthetic was really out of fashion. It was verboten. And so I basically spent that four years at Emily Carr having to justify the existence of my hand in the work I was making. Um, and, you know, it, yeah, I called it my conceptual boot camp it was kind of like going to school. And I'd come from this really incredible high school that I went to H.B. Beale in uh, London, Ontario, which was a technical vocational high school. So I'd had three years of really fantastic base training in um, 12 different studio areas from textiles and jewelry and metalwork and film and animation and lithography and etching and um, high school. This was high school. So it's a high school and all of our materials were basically free, like drawers and drawers of Stonehenge paper that were free. Uh, and I got bus tickets to go to the school that was downtown because I was taking a program that was not offered in my local high school. So it was awesome. And the, the program is still around and it came from this time. The school I think was started in 1912 where the arts were seen as a vocation. So this was kind of a school, it was a, it's a big school for students who were not going to be going onto an academic track or be pursuing college or university. So it was an opportunity to get your foot in the door on a trade before you graduated. And so people were doing like air conditioning and auto body or, you know, learning um, nursing, you know, nursing aids or hairdressing, like all of that was kind of a part of it. So you would do half a day academics and then half a day in whatever your, um, your area of study was. And they had this incredible arts program. And so I did regular high school for three years and I sucked at it. My um, counselor looked at my kind of file and he was like, you know, you need nine art credits to graduate. You've got 33. Uh, I'm not supposed to recommend you go to another school, but you might want to look at, at the school Beale. So anyway, that was how I got into Beale, which had this fanta fantastic kind of craft base understanding and, um, and training, but didn't, you know, we had art history every week. Um, we had live nude models once a week and studied at, like after doing six weeks of um, anatomy. But um, it didn't get into a lot of conceptual work or that kind of um, being able to think and write about what you were um, what you were making. That wasn't the focus at that point. Maybe now. Anyway, so when I arrived at Emily Carr, I had really strong foundational skills in the making, having come from textiles and ceramics, but I didn't have the strong conceptual. So Emily Carr was hard as hell for me, but it also gave me the skills to be able to justify doing what I want to do from the handmade craft aesthetic. I can put that into the art speak, uh, which is probably the best thing that Emily Carr did for me. Um, anyway, I spent a lot of time on that. So that was my kind of background training when I came out here and I knew I didn't want to be a commercial artist. So what did that mean? And I was working large scale, um, wanting to work large scale and 
ceramics had been my focus when I was at, at Emily Carr. And I got really frustrated with the whole craft art dialogue. It just like bored me to tears. Um, and so I always just kind of felt like I was on the outside, like I was an outsider. I was kind of an outsider artist um, working on the fringe. I didn't, you know, environmental art wasn't a big thing at that point. People knew about Andy Goldsworthy's work, but that was, you know, that was kind of um, Agnes Dene's. Um, you know, there were a few kind of trailblazers that, that we learned about and studied, but um, uh, I found a green waste pile in the morning walks down to the dog park um, of my local park. And I noticed that this is where the gardeners seem to always be leaving all the clippings of branches, et cetera, um, from the grounds work that she was doing. And then once a week, that pile would disappear. And so uh, I just started kind of poking at that pile of sticks and had this attitude of like, enough of anything can be made into something. And then what is that something? And that journey of inquiry was what really stoked and excited me. And that got me really kind of, um, essentially, I guess, returning to my textile roots, although I'd never done any basketry. And I kind of lament that I wasn't introduced to basketry sooner. I, um, I kind of fumbled my way through with the sticks kind of teaching me what they would do and wouldn't do or whatever the plants were that I was finding in the waste pile. And then um, I had this other revolution uh, or epiphany, I guess is a better word, where I had a foster dog that I had just adopted who was like this big shaggy beast and she shed like a Pomeranian size amount of fur every day. I was sweeping up from this tiny little apartment and I was just like, oh my God, this is driving me nuts. Like every, every time I turn around, there are these tumbleweeds of masses of gray fur floating across the floor. I'm constantly sweeping. And I had this memory, this kind of trigger of like, oh, this is sluts wool. This notion that, you know, sluts wool is old, old term. Um, origin, original term of slut is to be unclean. And this idea of like, you know, what gathers under your bed is sluts wool. And it was like, wool. well, I have a spinning wheel down in storage from my days as a teenager spinning. I pull out my spinning wheel and see if I can spin this, this floor sweeping. And so spinning that floor sweeping gave me suddenly this interest in sweeping where instead of I have to sweep and this really sucks, it's this never ending work. It was, it became a harvest. It became this exciting moment of, oh, I get to sweep. Like what the dog is dropping on the floor is actually a gift. This is something that is a resource if I just change how I think about it. And that was this like, mind blowing expansive moment for me of recognizing um, recognizing that huge opportunity. And, you know, we live in this way of constantly this duality of things that are good, things that are not things that we want, things that we don't, what's garbage, what's green waste. Um, all of that are these kind of new kind of post-industrial terms where really we used to use everything we had. And so getting back to this notion that, you know, when I go out and I do some gardening now, it's an opportunity to be gathering for materials. If I'm participating in an invasive species removal, what are those materials? What can be done with those? And it's not this like onerous task that has to be done. It's an opportunity for something else to happen. And being able to kind of approach that daily drudgery work uh, that's involved in taking care of a home or taking care of a garden, tending any landscape, if we can shift our thinking to, well, what's being provided here? And what are the skills or what are the tools that are required to utilize this gift that's being offered up? So that is kind of the, the kind of bigger zeitgeist of where my work has landed is looking for those opportunities and bringing community in to participate in that process and in that learning. Um, yeah, so what was your question again? <laughs> you did I introduce it. myself there? <laughs> we nailed it. It's inspiring to hear you 
talk about how you landed to where you are. I mean, also it's inspiring to just look at your Instagram to like look at your blog. Like you have like a Flickr and your blogs. I, I went and did that yesterday to just oh my god, re look at <laughs> visuals of your work. Also, yeah, seen it in person to the cool yeah. things that you make. But because I've definitely dabbled in that reality a few times, but then then I maybe living on the road, it's a little hard sometimes to gather large amounts of things within mm -hmm. space, but mm -hmm. when I lived in North Carolina. It just remember, it, it reminds me of times in my life where I was like thinking that way. And it's inspiring me to try to figure out how to do that again, no matter where I live. But living in North Carolina, we had to do a lot of clearing of like honeysuckle and privet and- um, Do you have kudzu also, down that way? Kudzu, yeah. Kudzu, kind of, yeah. I, I worked for an herbalist who had kudzu growing on the outside of her property, like where it literally every week when I get there, it had already grown like three feet back into the garden. So I would clear it every week, the edge, you know? Wow. Yeah. And all of those plants are great for basketry or weaving or fiber in different ways, depending on how they are, you know? And yeah, totally. Especially is really cool to see a culture of weaving kind of emerging out of that plant. Well, and not just emerging, when you look at the tradition, Japanese textiles, you know, kimonos were made with kudzu. Uh, it, it is a beautiful fiber and it's, you know, obviously this is a plant that is out of place. It was not intended to be where it is, but there's no getting rid of it now. It's abundant. And so how do you utilize that right and what's that piece that you can look at of where tending the land actually creates a business opportunity a skills development opportunity it's like looking at places through the states that have weld as um sorry uh not weld well woad as an invasive species uh and it's like well it's there because there used to be a textile industry here that was using it and it's that disconnect we've lost that relationship to the plant now but you know the plant was brought here for a purpose so why can't we get that going again and i know that's a really really simplistic answer there's all kinds of challenges there but still i think the question is worth posing why why can't we have kudzu shirts that are dyed with woad i think culture yeah. is a huge part of it my partner and i I used to do a lot of these botanical research projects and I'm trying to get back into doing that where I like do a big write up and like photography and like just like really experiment with certain plants. And we've been work playing around with Russian olive, which is a so-called invasive plant. Yeah, yeah. Which is demonized, it's in the West and then autumn olive is a, is a relative, it's a lot in the East, but I think they, they both kind of come together at different, I don't know about Canada. I think probably autumn olive and Russian olive probably come into Canada too. And then there's native species that are yeah. like relatives yeah. too. But just that in the Middle East, Russian olive is like a really revered food and medicine plant. And we're like yeah. finding all of this cool stuff about in yeah. Turkey and like Egypt and all these places where like people are, they, they love that plant, you know? And like here, I think a lot of people don't even know they think it has no use. It's not edible. Mm -hmm. It's only mm -hmm. bad. And I'm like, well, yeah. Again, I know that uh, that I, I know we're moving into that conversation about invasive plants and how we can like look at them differently. I, I I know that a lot of these we really can't eradicate. I mean, I know people want to try, but if we use them and integrate them into our culture, I mean, we don't really know what they're going to do in a hundred, two hundred years too. They might find. No. You know? And, it, you know, I feel, um, so I really, I am a, um, I practice many things and I am a master of nothing. Uh, and I'm always very clear about that. When I, when I'm talking with weavers, I always introduce myself as um, somebody who practices weaving, but I am not a weaver, like for a willow weaver, somebody to look at my work that it's, I'm, I'm not going to pass any tests in terms of the caliber of my weaving. Uh, and likewise, within stewardship and land tending practices, uh, permaculture, you know, I, I dip my toes into those areas and I know just, uh, just enough to kind of be engaged and potentially get myself into trouble, as some would say. But um, uh, there's, there's this separation, like humans just like to think we're above and outside of nature and controlling nature. And that is so problematic in 
how it manifests in our day-to-day -day actions and in decision-making where we don't recognize that humans have been keeping these species in check for thousands of years. There is this, there is this relationship, like th th this is how the plants are supposed, and the animals, right? This is, this is the interconnectedness. And when we have industrialized and separated ourselves out from the system to the extent that we have, this is where I feel a lot of those um, problems end up coming from is because the humans aren't involved and aren't using those materials anymore. They're maybe going to Home Depot and buying plastic Tupperware instead of weaving a basket with whatever they've got in their backyard, That right? Like it's, if we can put ourselves back into the system, if we can imagine ourselves back into that human ecosystem in fulfilling our daily needs, then there is a place that allows for those species that would otherwise be uh, too vigorous and outcompete other species to be kept in check and to be um, uh, used in a appropriate and respectful way. That, um, and I, yeah, and I think that's kind of a big part of what work I do is just kind of pose those questions and keep my eyes open for those opportunities and then bring other people in to work in that program in that process and kind of learn and discover and share together. So that's um, you know, within the city, that's that's a big part of what we're doing. And I have your book that you gave me last summer when we Oh yeah Saskatoon and I'm looking at it right now. It's really cool. God last June. Doesn't that feel like a decade ago now? <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> That's been 14 months and it could be 14 years. Seriously. What a different place we're in now. Yeah, totally. Um, you, in this book, you, you, I mean, and this was, I don't know what year was this cut out? 2014. Um, so you probably have done a lot. And a lot of I wrote it 2014. I think I was it published 2015. Uh, I think it came out November 2014. Yeah, that's what it says here. Uh, so I'm sure you have a lot of other things you've been doing since then. But in this book, I think it's really cool how you document kind of like the intention behind some of your projects in the city of Vancouver, right? That's where you are. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and using so-called invasive species. I say so-called because sometimes I even question that kind yeah. of invasive, but we won't go there in this conversation. Right. But um, using these abundant invasive species in the city to do remediation projects or to do like big sculptural projects that beautify places or, yeah, um, I find that so cool. And I, I liked how you documented that. And then you like had a whole how-to section of like, well, here's how you can actually do it you know yourself wherever you live yeah, yeah. So maybe you could speak a little bit about like the different plants that you've been working with in the city sure and yeah and i don't them. i don't do as much work with invasives as i used to um uh i still i kind of uh jump in and work with the stanley park ecology society occasionally and i i get pulled in to kind of consult and and such on projects but um um, a big part for me of working with the invasives uh, came about when I was working with um, Todd DeVries, who is a Haida cedar weaver. Um, in 2012, I think we did this project called the Urban Weaver Project. And one of the things that Todd was talking about, as somebody who is not living within his community in Haida Gwaii, but is here in the city, is, you know, how do you access cedar bark? and the challenge of that. And, uh, you know, there just aren't enough cedar trees for A, everybody who wants to weave, period, never mind, um, uh, or, or people who are culturally connected to working with cedar, never mind everybody who just wants to have that West Coast weaving experience of working with cedar. So this notion of looking at what were the, and I was, when I met Todd, I was doing a lot of work with English ivy and with Himalayan blackberry a little bit with holly and yellow flag iris and i was just kind of muddling my way through learning techniques on my own and you know learning from the plants essentially and applying that base core knowledge i had from my early textile training of you know weaving over under over under and just kind of 
taking that into my own style of random baskets and random weaving and um, crocheting, whatever. But um, when I met Todd, I really was wanting to meet somebody who actually had some weaving chops, who knew what they were working with, knew what they were doing. And so this kind of material challenge um, that we talked about of like, what do you do in the city? Where do you go? And that notion of where invasive species can really kind of bridge that gap of uh, material access, uh, regardless of what culture you come from. Um, it can be something that is um, plentiful and allow that introductory place to learning what it's like to work with a living or real material versus um, uh, you know kind of what I think of as being dead materials the kind of commercially processed like if you go and you buy that reed or that whatever it is at Michael's or craft shops where everything is kind of the same width and the same thickness and it's you know you may as well be working with cardboard for all the life that is in that material and so yeah, working with Ivy, um, it just became that opportunity to recognize how in, in many ways it is similar to spruce roots, for instance. It's very different, but it also has a lot of similarities and you can do a lot of the same techniques. It's great for twining. And that notion of, for me, being able to teach people without having to have precious materials so that you can make mistakes and you can try things and not be intimidated, not have that same, like the pressure of a clean, pristine white page that you're afraid to make a line on. Um, how can you learn and explore and experiment with these materials that are really abundant and they're for use? Uh, and then how do you do that safely? What are your disposal? What are things you have to make sure you're not starting ID patches in places that they weren't before uh, comes into it. But um, it really solidified for me that, you know, materials like cedar bark and, and spruce roots, um, those are very precious, precious materials that regardless of what culture you're coming from, uh, I feel you need to put your, your weaving time in on the materials that are available and get your chops up before you are worthy to meet those those other materials and then when you are looking at cedar bark um, in particular um, what is your cultural tradition to that material do you have a cultural and ancestral tradition to that material and i have woven with with cedar i have gone with my friend uh tracy and delmar williams who are from the squamish nation have taken me up to um, harvest cedar bark with them um, but it is certainly never something I would teach others or um, weave with and, and sell something made out of cedar weaving, uh, made out of cedar. It, um, I, I encourage others to leave those plants and leave those materials for those that need them because there is a real place for them. And I often remember Tracy, at the time I was working with Todd on this, um, saying, you know, I can't weave with ivy because the work or blackberry the work i'm doing is creating uh, cultural regalia and those plants weren't here when my ancestors were walking my ancestors aren't connected to those plants they, those those plants don't speak to my ancestors and that really hit home for me the importance of keeping those plants um, protected and available for those that need them to do that important work. And so for me, a part of the working with invasive species uh, becomes how are we tending those areas where we are actually supporting the plants that we want to have there. So for instance, removing yellow flag iris uh, so that there is more room for the species that would be in the riparian areas, um, whether they're um, the, the tules or um, scirpus species, but the, the plants that are doing that work and need to be there and are otherwise choked out by the invasives. So how can we remove the invasives to keep that space for the other plants? So most of my work now, um, that book came out when Trillium North Park was just being um, developed. 
And most of my work now is really uh, tending the plants at both means of production garden and trillium garden, uh, where we grow plants for traditional hand uses. And the plants that were chosen at trillium um, were primarily looking at plants that have been used traditionally by First Nations from around the province of British Columbia. So it's a little bit wider than just necessarily coastal, uh, which makes sense from a climate change perspective that we're much more like um, Kelowna or the interior than we were here a hundred years ago. Um, and also kind of getting beyond the kind of classic um, kind of 12 plants that every urban um, you know, native garden is supposed to have. So um, uh, planting fireweed and planting dogbane have been two of the species that um, it's taken me six years really to get those plants established uh, and happening in the gardens. There's been multiple stories about why it took so long, but um, so those are two plants that I haven't got as much of a working relationship or understanding of using because my time has always been protecting those plants and, and you know, harvesting invasives around them if I was in other places, uh, and then trying to be their advocate, if you will, and get them established here in the city um, in an area that can be tended and um, and worked and, and bring that relationship back to, well, what is the season of fireweed? When do we harvest medicine uh, for tea? When do we harvest the fluff? When do we harvest the, the bark? How are, you know, what's, what's going on with the fireweed? So I'm, I'm figuring all that out at this point. I'm glad you brought that point up about like culturally significant plants and just there's a dynamic to that that it's different everywhere you are and I don't know sometimes like that it's not so clear always you know cedar feels like a really yeah. clear example it's obvious yeah. yeah we all know I mean not we we don't all know but many people who spent time in the Pacific Northwest know that the logging practices and the land the practices of like how the land's being used has made the cedar populations dwindle and therefore also the, the ability for indigenous peoples to harvest their bark mm -hmm. is less, right? The, those yep. trees don't bounce back as the same as other conifers or other trees. Yeah. Before. Yeah. They need certain conditions. But like, I've been thinking about this a lot because I had this conversation with, I don't know if you know Aganok, who's a weaver, who's somebody yeah. who was yeah. in gatherings. She yeah. was on the podcast a couple years ago and talked a little bit about like, having consciousness for folks to have consciousness around like certain material using certain materials in their craft practice right not to say that you should and you shouldn't clearly mm -hmm. but like mm -hmm. consciousness around that and then last year or this actually it was earlier this year it feels like last year but I did a episode on wild tending on the podcast um and wild tending requires harvesting sometimes you know sometimes it's just about seed dispersal or divisions or whatever like these practices that humans can have on the land that can benefit and like increase diversity or abundance right and willow is a is a plant that is obviously used in weaving um in the west western turtle island canada right there's willow in canada right and oh, in, sure. yeah and in um the u.s and uh then it also was a european weaving material too mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, but someone put a comment on that episode saying like you know where i live in northern california the indigenous peoples would prefer us ask before we harvest willow on in certain areas and even though it's a european ancestor there's traditions of weaving in europe you know it's really specific to that place in those patches and being traditionally tended and like there's no clear like you should or shouldn't weave with it it's just like I yeah, know, I guess I'm not sure what I'm trying to say or ask other than like it sparked my thought process because you can't always ask indigenous peoples in certain it's, places. It's you know? hard. It's a, yeah. And you know, um, Cease Weiss, a woman I have great respect for, um, uh, she's known as the uh, plant diva. Um, uh, she is um, Squamish Nation um, and talks about the importance of asking the nation whose territory you're on 
And, but yes, that, that is, that's hard. That's complex because who do you ask? And just because you, just because you know somebody that is of that nation, the assumption that they are going to feel the capacity to be the person that gives, right? Like, what does that look like? And it, and I think about that a lot because, you know, weird, circuitous route that has placed me at the age of 51 as this white woman living well below the poverty line with all of this downtown urban land gardens, like a couple of hectares. I don't know, I suck at scale, so I'm never good at holding that. But that I somehow am the kind of key holder to all of these plants that are growing and all of this, you know, like that, that I, you know, where there are people whose territory I am working on who would have had the ancestral rights to that place and would have been those key holders or gatekeepers or whatever term you want to put to it that would have been basically the, um, the, the stewards or the tenders that were witnessing what was happening to the land, what was happening to the plants and the animals, and saying to people that asked them, yes, you can harvest that, it's a good year, or no, I've already had 10 people come in and harvest, no, it's actually those plants aren't doing well, or the fish aren't, didn't return as strong, right? Like that um, ongoing, long, long, durational, inherited, um, place of responsibility to tend and observe and witness a place and that system existed and it was destroyed with colonization and so now what has that left us with it's left us with this broken system where we don't know what those records are we don't know who those people are it's highly political it's super super charged here in Vancouver, we have three nations uh, whose uh, land this Vancouver area is. Uh, and within the nations, there is conflict of whose area is whose. So even from the city and municipal perspective of who they have to negotiate with or who they're approaching, they can't go to one nation, they have to go to all three nations. And the assumption that all three nations are going to be able to agree, it's super challenging. Like it's just, it's way beyond my capacity to try and sort out and hold. But all I know is that for various reasons, I have um, ended up uh, in this place of kind of tending and being the, the primary person that is currently being witness to the land and the plants and the seasonal changes and how those plants are doing. And I'm the one that people come to and make those requests of, which is kind of weird and icky at times when I really kind of allow myself to think too deeply about it. Uh, I try my best to be a good ally and um, make connections wherever possible, create openings and opportunities for uh, people that are either our um, local three nations or other Aboriginal, Indigenous Aboriginal people that are living in the city that are needing to make medicine, are needing a particular wood for a project, whatever, that I can be an ally for them and make that material access possible, um, as well as the skill sharing and kind of free placement in classes or, you know, whatever connecting people. So I just try as much as possible to be a good ally and to be a bridge and to let that kind of flow through what I'm doing and what I'm holding. Yeah, yeah, it's really complex. And where we are in Colorado is traditional Ute land. And we thought about that, like, shh, okay, so say we want to harvest some dog bane, I don't know, like from the riverside, like, should we go ask the Ute tribe? We actually don't know anyone that really in the tribe to harvest dog bane, like what they think we're ridiculous for asking. Maybe they don't even really know much about yeah. dog bane here. Yeah. Like, it's different everywhere and then where I'm from in Virginia there's not like a it's colonization happened so much longer ago there isn't like there isn't there are hardly any reservations not that reservations are always a good thing but like there isn't the Cherokee have a reservation but like there's not a lot of 
uh, indigenous sovereignty and like and presence on the land and so mm -hmm. it, it's not to, to ask if I could harvest hickory nuts or something it's just like there's no one to really ask and yeah. they may not even have a connection to that yeah. anymore because it's been so long and severed so long so it's just not to say that we shouldn't try you know of course to well to and so how do you yeah so how do you reconcile that right what what are what are simple small as well as big things that we as individuals can each take on that perhaps make things better whether it is for me the biggie that i just come back to is how do i take care of the plants how do i be a good ally to the plants and how do i support the plants how do i increase the plants how do i spread and give as many people as are game to plant nettle seeds how do i get nettle seeds out there to the greater <laughs> the greater good um, and fireweed and how do i you know shift how parks thinks about what plants are actually deserving in park space that's a big part of kind of what i find myself doing is just trying to change that older school sensibility of what plants belong in parks and how we use parks but um it's sometimes it's it's easier because i those strong relationships with the plants like that's that's my immediate relationship i have i have friends within um the squamish nation that i can go to and have conversations with and ask but ultimately for me personally in my day-to-day -day work it's the plants and if I'm supporting those plants, then there is this trickle effect where that is going, you know, if that is going to impact and uh, potentially aid uh, First Nations people who are wanting access to those plants. So it's it's maybe a step or two steps removed, but I feel like there is uh, a way there that is easier for me to identify and to um, kind of address and act on uh, so you know if you are not able to um, ask somebody permission when you're going to harvest those nuts can you be doing whatever you can to plant nuts in other places that are going to be perhaps close to the reservations or in other places where people will be able to access uh, for more nuts 20 or 30 years from now uh, can you be giving some of the nuts that you're harvesting to people that you meet that don't have the capacity themselves to get out and harvest and gather um, and so you know and that's for me like when i'm harvesting fiber or whatever what like what fibers am i giving away how am i supporting other people's process and journey so i so it, it always for me it just comes back to the plants because that is that is a piece that doesn't feel political um, that doesn't feel as um, emotionally loaded is a weird word to use but i'm lacking a different way of putting it and it anyway it's simple right if i just if i tend the plants if i take care of the plants if i increase the plants that are of this place that belong in this place and if i can plant more fireweed and stinging nettle everywhere i go then perhaps I will leave a little pocket of this city in better shape than I found it. <laughs> I don't know, it's, it's really, it's so, it's so basic. It feels like nothing and yet sometimes it feels so overwhelming. Have yeah. You, since the park, so you, you've been able to plant nettles in parks? I know that's probably- Oh my God, yeah. So <laughs> don't tell anyone. <laughs> so yeah, and so it's interesting. Uh, I keep waiting for when I'm gonna get the calls from park board that there have been complaints about the amount of nettles that I've got growing in city parks and that call hasn't come yet. Um, but I can tell you it was an interesting thing getting fireweed growing because fireweed uh, is seen as a weed that, you know, even it's, com even it's common name that we all call it fireweed has got weed embedded in the name. And I think what it comes down to is, um, you know, when you when you break down how people see invasive plants, it's complicated. And again, it's like that. Uh, everything is everything is on a on a scale, or you know, there's this gradient. And 
Uh, people think of invasive plants as being plants that are from elsewhere, but actually invasive plants can be plants that belong in a place, but they don't fit the human agenda for that land. That's, that's essentially, right? We just kind of cut through the chase. That's what we call an invasive species. And so fireweed is seen as an invasive, as I understand it, in gardens because it speaks to a place being untended. It's like dandelions. Um, for years, I would do nothing but remove dandelions because if there weren't dandelions, and if I put up a, a nice woven fence and I took out the dandelions, people would see a place as somehow intentional, even if it didn't look like what they thought a garden should look like, hmm. they wouldn't complain because it looked tended. But dandelions and fireweed are both species that people have forever seen as being weeds and therefore, you know, ergo garden untended. So trying to get past that, and it's been great this, this past few years, you know, pollination has become such a hot topic now. Everybody is aware of how, well, everybody, most people are aware that dandelions are an early feeder for bees and how important they are, um, which is great. So now it's like, save the dandelions, all the good things that dandelions can do. Uh, and same with fireweed, but the park board operations here did not want to see fireweed in the general garden bed area, you know, and garden beds is a, a glamorous term, but really it's just like a, a planted zone that's not lawn is a better way. That's what I mean when I say gardens. Um, and what we came down to through various conversations was that a raised bed hmm. was fine. And so we have this raised bed at Trillium that is um, probably about 30, okay, if I look at it from my apartment to give a scale, it's probably about 30 feet by 18 feet. Is, and it, it's almost, um, uh, yeah, anyway, and it's, it's, it's not a square bed, but there's a lot of dog bane and um, fireweed that, the park board operations nursery actually started for me. I gave them the seeds and they started, you know, 240 fireweed seedlings and I think about 40 dog bane. And with the fireweed being in this raised bed, there is this psychological uh, relief that somehow it's a tended area that is raised above or separated from if the fireweed was just in amongst the willow and the nettle. Anyway, so there's a little takeaway for everybody that's trying to negotiate with an operations or a city system. Raised beds are separate. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, you know, once we figured that out, it's great. That, that, so I have all this fireweed that I'm very conscious of making sure um, I get some people out there to harvest the fluff once the seeds open up um, before we are seeding the entire neighborhood. We do, you know, there is a lot of seed that does distribute because there's a lot of blow away, but it's so beautiful and it, it's just such a gorgeous plant and everybody loves it. And yeah, and there's all these nettles that are in the park as well um, that uh, I don't know how they got there. I certainly didn't seed them, Kelly. I'm not sure where the nettle came from, but yes, there's lots of it. And uh, we actually had, <laughs> I will never admit to anything, um, park board um, uh, team that was working on, or is working on um, urban pollinator projects came around. I saw one day, this was in the springtime, um, just was this maybe this was last year it must must have been pre-covid it's in the before uh anyway i noticed when i was working that there was like three or four people with clipboards walking around looking in the garden it's like who are those people and i went over and i knew one of them uh was somebody i've worked with before and they were just doing a survey of all of the urban pollinator projects that had been started in the city in the last four or five years to just see where things were we're at and it was in May and all the lupins were out and the place was beautiful and it was just literally humming with activity and one of the people made the comment they were like oh man this is the best you have got you know this is the best results we've seen for 
a pollinator zone really functioning and working. And I like pointed at the nettle. It's like, well, you know, there's all these things that we know nettle is great for, for supporting its neighboring plants, for uh, how it is providing habitat. Uh, you know, I've taken so many videos of ladybug porn, as I call it, of the ladybugs just humping away on the little nettle leaves. It's awesome. So anyway, the, the nettle is really doing wondrous things for what is otherwise kind of an industrialized like post-industrial wasteland that was replanted five or six years ago and um it's messy it doesn't look like a beautiful tended garden but there is um you know the fireweed the dog bane i've got lots of tea plants in there as well uh lots of nettle um and uh, lupins, yarrow, um, there's snowberry bushes, there's lots of nutka rose. So, you know, there's lots of species and then there's some trees that are um, starting to develop. But um, being able to get Park Board um, working with us, and Vancouver's very unique. Uh, I think there's only two cities in North America. The other one is somewhere stateside that has a park board that is separate from our city council. We actually have two elected. So we have kind of park board commissioners as well as a city council. Uh, and then within the park board team, we have the ACE team, Arts, Culture and Engagement. And it is a staff of about eight people that work with park board in placing artists in communities and in city parks and in community centers that are you know, professional community engaged artists that are engaging the community in their arts practice. And there is a real push within that for environmental art. Uh, so I've been really, really lucky and had my practice um, incredibly supported by this arts culture and engagement team to make the work that I'm doing possible a within the city parks. Cities don't have that. No, no. So, you know, that has been really, those are my champions within the administrative level to look at what, what are the plants that are going into city parks and how can we have a couple of parks that have this, uh, essentially we have operating agreements with the city of Vancouver for environmental education. Uh, so we're seen as learning gardens. Uh, so we're not, we're kind of a hybrid. We're not a community garden where people have individual plots but we are these city full access public parks that grow artist materials or materials for traditional hand use uh, and are kind of tasked with finding ways to connect people to those plants and learning those skills and learning about tending those plants together. So it really becomes this bigger picture of how we rethink what city parks are for beyond being this pretty backdrop for your personal picnics and your Instagram photos. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so. I had a question for you that I sent you yesterday. Yeah. But, and you basically have answered it in a lot of ways is like, how could artists and craft people be really great bridges between our greater culture and problem solving ecological issues? And I know that like, from a conceptual art perspective, that means one thing, like planting yeah. ideas in people's heads. But then from a craft perspective, there's this other hands-on element and yeah, I guess what, do you have anything else to say about that? Because I find that fascinating. And I don't know, I just, I don't even engage in the whole art versus craft. Like, I just don't care. That's just, to me, others can put whatever labels on that they want. Um, I refer to myself as a community engaged environmental artist. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think, vague enough, <laughs> but it also, so it's much more kind of a social practice is I think the core piece in that. And, um, um, well, from either per place, yeah, or both, or all of it hybrid. I think that's that the division is kind of dissolving in a lot of ways right now. I think yeah, and you know, this, this is the thing about being an artist is that you define your own practice, and you know, you can put your own labels on whatever you want, but you define what works for you and how you want to work. So, if you want to call yourself an artist, um, great. If you want to call yourself a craftsperson, fantastic. Whatever, whatever label fits. Um, I identify more with gardeners than I do with artists. Mm -hmm. uh, I identify more with uh, people that are in the ancestral skills community than I do with 
artists. Like I, I actually, when I introduced myself, you know, like the, the, remember the days when we'd go to cocktail parties? <laughs> so, you know, that kind of, when you'd introduce yourself to someone and you'd say you're an artist and they'd be like, oh, so am I, what do you know? I'm a painter. And I, I just have this kind of, I have this inward kind of cringe of like, oh shit, how do I unpack what it is I do and recognize that somebody that identifies themselves as, as an artist could very, very well be just worlds removed from where I am situated um, in the work I do. I find a much closer proximity for the most part with people that are, um, you know, homesteaders or, you know, uh, I'm a fermenting artist, whatever, like <laughs> whatever. Uh, but that, that notion of how do we be human? How do we make and take care of ourselves with what we have around us. I think that is kind of where I've settled myself for what really gets me out of bed in the morning and keeps me going forward is more of this notion of how do we take care of ourselves and each other with what we've got in our own environment. And for me, that means looking at these two, these two pieces of land and the plants within them that I have ended up being the tender of. Yeah, I find like, no matter creative people in general, you know, have the capacity to stretch beyond, often anyways, beyond yeah. like labels or boundaries that are already there. Like th these are people that can connect things that seem like they would be two different things together and somehow yep. make it work. Yeah. And I think um, people say like, oh, like, you'll never make a living as an artist. You can't fit into the system. Well, that's kind of a good thing because the system that we're supposed to be fitting into is problematic in so many ways. And so artists yeah. are disruptors of that in a lot of ways. Yeah. And when it yeah. comes to people who are creative, whether they're artists, crafts, whoever, however you want to label yourself, like have this capacity to change it from the inside out or something, you know, in whatever way their gift is. And so I think then the more of those people however they do it in the world the better you know like that's it almost feels like a spider web model to me of like and for what you're doing too of yeah. taking this thing and that thing and this thing and putting it together and it, it kind of like sparks yeah. something you know yeah absolutely and I um um I, I kind of thought of myself from the perspective of realizing it's like I'm getting to have the education I wish I could have had as a child I'm doing those things now as an adult and I'm taking others along on that journey with me. And I, you know, like, wow, what an amazing thing to be able to do. But I'm really, um, I, I teach from the perspective generally, you know, and it's like, I've been doing this for 20 years now. So yeah, actually I do know how to do some things. I have learned some things in that time. Um, and I am surprised when I find that I actually am an expert at, at certain things, but for the most part, what I'm really interested in is being able to ask good questions and learn new things from posing those questions with others and having a group of people that come together to figure out how to answer those questions. You know, like the, I don't know, was the Soil to Sky project in the book or did that happen after? Um, I feel like, I can't, I can't remember, remember if I saw it, it here in there. or I saw it on your web, the, the earth. Okay. So that, that to me was a project that um, ended up being much smaller than we'd initially hoped because we didn't get the funding that we had hoped for, but it's still for me is just such a beautiful, um, beautiful way of summing up what we do where uh, myself and Rebecca Graham that was working uh, with me uh, through Earth Hand Gleaners at the time, um, kind of posed the question, like, how could we make a kite from materials we are growing and gathering ourselves from the ground. And so we partnered with the um, BC Kite Flyers uh, Association, which is a nonprofit in town that is normally they get together and they are like putting on kite flying festivals and traveling around um, flying kites and they build their own kites. And so they understand the dynamics of the kite and what a high functioning kite needs to be. And so we started with them of what a high functioning kite needs to be and all the kind of core components of it. And then we broke that down. So we grew the flax and we spun it uh, into kite line. 
and you know we had to Navajo ply uh, three ply that line so that it was like test weight of like two three hundred pounds uh, and then we dyed it with coreopsis just because that was fun and uh, we had a local paper maker that worked with us taking various fibers from the garden and making paper and um, that happening uh, one of the kite um, makers working with us um, taught us how to split bamboo fine enough that we could be making the bamboo frames, um, what, to, what to use for glue. Uh, that was the one that ended up being the hardest and the most um, kind of from afar. We had to go to Langley, which is, I don't know, like 40 kilometers south or something uh, for um, rawhide. So we used um, a rawhide glue because the other glues that we were trying to make um, uh, were too heavy and not tacky enough. And uh, pine pitch, for instance, we were trying to use pine pitch um, as one of the base materials. So it was this great opportunity of having um, paper makers and spinners and um, woodworkers and fiber artists and all of these people and then gardeners and children's educators uh, all kind of come together and learn all of these skills as kind of a small closed co cohort of about 10 people being paid a stipend to work with us in learning all these skills. And then we went to various festivals and did one of the skills at a festival. So maybe we were paper making at a garden festival and um, demonstrating spinning at a, another um, harvest festival and you know engaging people in the different steps of that and and making these kites that um, we did fly at the end of the series and so you know it, at the end of the day it's not really about the kite being in the air it's about those people having the time and the space to come together and to meet each other and to exchange stories to uh, develop some common ground and build relationships with one another and to just have that time with their hands busy making together and learning new things and then seeing where they can take that into their own practice and um, yeah it was, it was so it was a beautiful thing and so you know taking on that kind of research project um, requ requires a lot of energy to organize, to plan, to, you know, uh, the conceptualization, to the writing and the budgeting and the finding the funding and all of those pieces just to bring those people to the room. Um, that it requires uh, dedicated, creative individuals that can take the time and the space to make that happen. And so when we get to do that, that's just brilliant. That's super exciting. And at the end of the day, it's not really about the kite that got into the air, but it's super cool that we did get the kite into the air. It's about what all those people are gonna do now with that, the connections with each other and those processes, you know? Yeah, and new ways, new ways of looking at common materials, um, new ways about, you know, for the kite makers, um, I think it blew them away. They thought we were really kind of just crazy as hell when we first um, approached them with the idea. They were like, who are these people? You guys are weird, but you know, kite flyers are weird too. So we actually fit really well together. We found that it was, it was good. It was a very simpatico weirdness for kind of, yeah. So yeah, bringing together quirky, nerdy people that can share their passion and find that common ground and just lift everybody up, right? Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's good work. Hearing you talk about flax and paper and like material, making things all from like materials from the land is reminding me of spending time with Jim Croft. I've probably mentioned you to him. I've listened to your podcasts with him. Yes, He's funny. Yeah, you know, or mentioned him to you. And yeah. there's so much more. I have a lot of recordings of him talking about flax and hemp and stuff too. But yeah. um, just his perspective and way of doing things it's almost like that's his default alongside gleaning you know yeah so it's like about traditional ways of doing things intermingled in this post-apocalyptic thing and yeah you like, have, you know, you ever, have you done an interview with mary ever uh melody his partner melody his, his partner melody have you done I, an interview i haven't i asked her and she's like i don't know she's kind of not sure but although her kids are like you really should interview her. I think that 
I don't know what, maybe at some point she'll be interested, interested in it, but at least the past two years when I've spent time there, I didn't go there this summer, but she's been like, maybe, I don't know. And she's always really busy too when I'm there. Cause if I'm yeah. there in their classes, she's just like swamped. So she's also really interesting the way she does things. And she's less in the spotlight as Jim, but she's just as uh, talented, you know? Yeah, that's my sense. Well, you could let her know that there's been a request. <laughs> There's been a few people who have like, you yeah. know, you're from Melody, Melody, you know, I'm like, sorry, I have to convince her without being too forceful about it. Too. Right. Yeah. She's yeah. Like, what is this podcast thing you're doing? Like, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, her, she has some beautiful stories too. And like her relationship with the plants too is really amazing. And yeah, her, mm -hmm. she's, she has taken some class. She took a class with Margaret Matthewson years ago that was like the only class she really ever took and then she's like spent a lot of time just like teaching herself how to work with all these different materials you know and so in the way they live in the world they live in it's kind of aside from the modern world in a lot of senses like it, they're not tapped into that like stream yeah. of the collective consciousness of all the news and aside yeah. from the video you know yeah so they just make time in their lives that it's all about that and then other things come you know yeah. So, yeah, it's really cool, but, <laughs> well, uh, you I wanted to ask me about flax and nettle. Yes, and you spoke a little bit about nettles, about planting it, um, and growing it and that kind of thing, but yeah, maybe you could, you could, like, yeah, so I, nettles. you know, I, I started growing, um, my friend Penny Copeland, um, is a, a spinner and a weaver and a dyer and, you know, has done it all, um, and she had come to me five, six years ago, and she was like, you know, this environment is perfect for growing flax. If you want to be looking at, uh, sustainable, uh, cloth and fiber and that piece, um, we could look at getting a little flax crop together. So she actually um, wrote a little grant, got like, I think it was a thousand dollars or something to be able to um, uh, hire a friend to build our flax processing equipment. And he made that equipment and um, she tracked down seeds and we did this little plot and that kind of started this whole flax process for us. And, you know, I've been reading um, various books, uh, you know, Flax is seen as being one of our founding agricultural crops. Um, I've read anywhere from nine to 12,000 years um, that humans have been actively growing uh, as an agricultural crop flax for both you know, seed and, uh, and cloth. And I've recently just kind of been thinking about the fact that um, this notion that we haven't necessarily domesticated flax, but that perhaps flax has domesticated us, you know, that, that we are the ones that, you know, that, that, that plant needs us to put it in the ground uh, at kind of the hundredth day of the year and that it's another hundred days until we harvest. And there's this kind of rhythm that's linked into the humans doing the work to make the flax possible uh, relative to nettle as this uh, perennial plant that just keeps coming back and has got, again, a thousands and thousands of years history of clothing people um, all over the Northern Hemisphere. There's very, you know, versions of um, stinging nettle that grow. And uh, it has kind of defied domestication. Um, and I think there have been probably some attempts. It's a much more challenging to process than um, flax for, to my sense, two reasons. One is that it's got a gum that doesn't exist on either hemp or flax, the other two main bast fibers. It's got a gum that's harder to ret and take away. It's also a hollow tube, uh, which means it doesn't kind of like, you can't smash it and extract fibers the way you can with flax and a flax break. So it's a little more uh, nuanced and hands-on. And of course it stings. So it's probably a lot harder to just motivate a workforce <laughs> to be harvesting it. Um, but there's something there of where, you know, I've, I've read, um, I think Robin, no, is it Jeanette Armstrong or Robin Wall Kimmerer that talk about nettle sting as being uh, the plant 
telling you to take notice. Mm. It's like the plant is telling you, like, I'm here, pay attention to me. And, and that, you know, nettle is this very kind of fierce plant up front. It feels a little wild and it's, it's got that kind of fierceness because of that edge that's intimidating versus flax, which is this very gentle, beautiful plant to look at. And it's very soft on the hand. It's very strong, but it's also very compliant and it kind of processes into this beautiful blonde strix so beautifully and easily relative to nettle. And um, yeah, so I'm kind of, I go back and forth between working with flax and working with nettle. Um, and my, my learnings about both fibers have really been impacted from the, the capacity to go from one plant to the other. And what I learned in processing with one, I can apply to the other. And I kind of feel like maybe someday when I retire, I'm gonna write a book. I'm gonna write a story about the three sisters uh, flax, hemp, and nettle. And of course, um, they all are medicine and they're all fiber. And one is the good sister that does what she's told that of course has this beautiful blonde hair and blue eyes. And then there is the, uh, the wild sister, the party sister who is, um, the one that's just always kind of in trouble with the law and has kind of had a challenging history and is being misunderstood, um, getting herself in trouble. And then Nettle is the, um, the, the wild sister that's the outsider that doesn't want to live with the community that you know, lives in the forest uh, outside of where the pack is and scares a lot of people. Um, are intimidated by her, but when you get close, you realize that she's got everything you need and has got so much to share and is really taking care of the other plants and other people that are around her uh, in what she's feeding them and offering them. So there's, there's a story there. There's a fable that probably already exists, but I haven't found it yet. But I love this notion of these three fiber plants that humans have got this long, long, uh, ingrained relationship or, or different relationships with. And um, nettle for me is my medicine in many, many ways. I was really, um, really touched when I read in Ireland a few years back, I was in a museum that had this beautiful um, uh, didactic display on uh, clothing uh, ancient clothing in um, in Ireland, and they talked the four main fibers that people would have been wearing in Ireland 10,000 years ago were nettle, flax, and dog hair, and wolf hair were the four fibers. And, you know, I live in a place that is um, where stinging nettle was used for fishnets, where stinging nettle would have been used for um, clothing people. And so it's this, nettle is the bridge, it's the cultural medicine, and it's the bridge for me that links my own ancestors to this place and links me to this place and is the shared commonality I have with um, the people who are from this place that uh, also have that shared connection to stinging nettle in their own ancestry and their own history. So it, um, yeah, it feels like the more I can learn about nettle, the more I can work with nettle and be sharing that with others, because again, it's a plant that across the Northern hemisphere has been used and has been appreciated and celebrated. And the stories that do exist that have been written about nettle, um, the songs, the poems, you know, there's so much out there that speaks to a long, long entrenched understanding and awareness of nettle that has been kind of lost for the most part. Part it's um yeah, as Tracy, Tracy would say, it's it's sleeping knowledge, and we're we're just waking that up. So every year I learn more from nettle. It continues to surprise. She is a, a strong and powerful teacher that. Um, is great for my arthritis, uh, is good for my soul. Uh, time with the plant is always, is always good.
Yeah. Anyway, yeah, I could go on about nettle forever. But it's, I think the big thing is when I can be learning about nettle and then taking that to different communities and sharing what I'm learning about nettle with other people to kind of just not have the plant be demonized and have it be something that people recognize like, oh yeah, nettle, she stings, be careful, walk around, give her respect that she deserves, but don't pull it, uh, leave it, the bees need it, the other plants need it, the ladybugs, all that, you know, it's it's doing its thing and it's giving us medicine, it's giving us fiber, it's giving us tea. There's so much there if we have respect for her. I push my dad edge with nettles. He's a horticulturalist and my grandma grandma <laughs> was a horticulturalist. So he's like homesteading now and not not running a business selling plants anymore. But I would when I lived out east more, I would bring plants to his land a lot. Like be like, you should plant this here, you know? And I did bring nettles one time. He was like, what are you doing? <laughs> he's like, oh Lord, that's how you would say it. You want me to plant this? It's over. It stings. I'm like, but it's good. You know, he did plant it because he wanted to make me happy. So he planted it. And now it's like in this creek area and it's kind of taken on its own. Yeah. It's just, it was just, yeah, it was interesting to interface with that, like from his horticulture yeah. background. But no kidding. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, I was asked to give a talk last year about um, stinging nettle. Um, to a group of master gardeners and <laughs> so that was interesting because uh, most of them you know what did i talk about uh, why plants deserve place in our gardens deserve space in our gardens and so it was nettle daylily and um uh, himalayan blackberry to just talk about what are some other ways of thinking about these species that people are either just dis otherwise dismissive of and um yeah it was interesting getting people on board with nettle but one of the one of the terms I heard heard years back that has really stuck with me is that it was the clothing of the landless, mm. and that is that resonates as somebody who uh, lives in the downtown east side um, will never own property in this city um, will never own property probably ever uh, but. Uh, that notion that if you were attached to land, whether you were um, uh, tending somebody else's land, whether you were uh, the owner of the land, you likely were wearing linen and wool, but like linen would be your baseline. And it was the people who didn't have access to land for that spring planting and summer harvesting, et cetera, that would be, uh, the, you know, the travelers, the Roma, whomever that would be gathering nettles in their in their journey and so there's something there for me also that that kind of fits um yeah anyway it's yeah, yeah. Jim is love the nettle yeah and Jim has talked a lot to me about flax and hemp and there there being this class divide with hemp being for the lowly people or whatever and yeah Max being this fine thing but he also talked about and I don't remember if it was in the interview on the podcast but how sometimes it was hemp was even labeled as linen flax but when it was actually hemp just because people had this conception of hemp as right like for the low class or whatever so a lot of people are wearing hemp and think they're wearing something else but yeah I had this I had this interesting little um epiphany uh earlier this spring so i've been working on making a nettle shirt and um processing a lot of nettle and spinning a lot of nettle and i've spun a lot of flax and made a couple of shirts with um with local linen that i've grown and so the thing with linen is it ends up being separate grades you have your line linen which are your long fiber and then you have the shorter what's left in the hackles which is called toe t-o-w and the toe is also used, you know, some of it would be made into paper uh, for currency or, you know, various products that are made with it, but a lot of it would still be spun and was the clothing that poor people, people that were um, working others' lands, slaves, those that were not having the, the money for the good quality linen were wearing this toe. And toe is itchy, it's scratchy, it's not nice on the skin. Nettle, has the same quality where you end up with your line nettle and you've got your shorter nettle fiber, the toe, 
the toe from nettle is silky and soft. And I had this moment of recognizing like, holy shit, both of these fibers go back thousands and thousands and thousands of years in humanity's process. At some point, there were decisions being made to, you know, take flax into a more industrial model and a more consumer regular model, uh, whereas nettle was left on the side. And it would have likely been known that nettle had a softer product in the byproduct than linen and, and then flax. And, and even at that point, it would have been that the lower classes or the working poor or the poor people and what their needs were or what their physical requirements were, were being dismissed because the flax was easier to process. And that, right? I, yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's just me making stuff up, right? That's just me kind of making up my own little conspiracy about <laughs> what went down thousands of years ago, but it feels completely possible that there were various decisions made at various points a long, 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 long time ago, recognizing linen was easier and cheaper to process, even though the product that was created for the working poor or the poorer class was far inferior to the nettle and that that was dismissed out of hand as not mattering. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So here we are. Things have changed so much, haven't they? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah. It just went dark there. <laughs> so good. Well, before we wrap this up, if people want to glean or like experiment wherever they are, do you have any kind of advice for how people can be creative in that way? Oh, you know, just really look at what is the excess that is around that um, has maybe been dismissed. And um, I have a couple of little kind of hand tests that I like to do when I'm meeting somebody new um, on the land. Uh, if you can take a fiber and wrap it around your um, all four fingers and not pull your fingers apart, um, then the fiber has strength. If you can twist it around a finger, an individual finger, without it fraying, then it's got capacity for twist. And so just even being able to, you know, um, pull a blade of grass or a, a dried uh, stalk of an unknown plant or a leaf of an unknown plant and see what that, see how it responds to some twist and uh, recognize if it's not not doing anything that seems useful. Uh, try it at a different season. Recognize there is a season for everything. So some things you just can't harvest uh, in June. It's like their time isn't going to be till October or November. Um, so having that awareness of what's in your environment and what is abundant and what is um, what is the plant giving up. What are the things that uh, you know, daylily is something I always encourage when I hear teachers wanting to get students working with plants. I tell them to put daylilies in because it's um, a plant that's really drought tolerant. And come September when school starts, all of those uh, green leaves are starting to golden and you can just give them a gentle tug and the leaves release without any tools. So you can have a group of children that are pulling plants without having to hand them all sharp tools and you've got immediate um, material that is ready for a really quick soak and you can be teaching rope making without having any other tools required. So, um, you know, looking at what are the plants, if that doesn't fit for your environment, what are the other species that are kind of like that? And um, what are the plants that belong where you live and are you finding them? Can you seed save from them and plant more of them? Uh, so that you're not having that hard challenge of getting into, have other people harvested here before me already? Am I taking 10%? Am I taking 30%? Have somebody already taken 70%? Uh, if you've got a particular area, uh, just, you know, cracks and sidewalks, plant seeds. Yeah. Mm, cool. <laughs> Where can people find you 
uh, online. It seems like you have a few different. Zones. Yeah. Well, yeah. So Instagram, my website is useless. I haven't, it was hacked. I don't think I've put anything on it in three or four years and it's yeah. Anyway. So my, um, uh, Instagram is just Sharon Callis and, um, the nonprofit that, um, I started, uh, is called earth hand gleaners society. And our website is um, uh, maintained, uh, and I send out a newsletter once a month. So if people just kind of want to stay in touch, pretty much everything now is on Zoom. So there's lots of Zoom classes and options that will keep happening through Zoom. So yeah, that's probably earthhand.com and Sharon Callis on Instagram. And then your book, um, people can find that. On, can you find it on Amazon or? It, you know what? It was on Amazon. It is now out of print. Okay. So I have copies. Um, but yeah, I think it probably is still available on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you going to get that reprinted anytime soon? I don't know. Um, New Society Publishers that I worked with was great. Um, they were lovely. Uh, so it's just, you know, I don't know how sales work uh, on all of that. But um, yeah, I don't know. We'll see if it becomes a treasured classic in another 15 years and they decide to bring it back. <laughs> Super cool. Yeah, I'm like, I sh I'm surprised. Like I, I know that person, Nick Neto, who wrote um, Organic Artist. Oh, the Organic Artist, yes. I'm like, I, I don't know if he's been getting it, repu if he's getting it republished or not, but like more stuff like that, I feel like should be out there, you know, in the yeah. that vein. Yeah. Like, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks for uh, being on the podcast. Finally, I know uh, I wanted to try to do it in person last year, but we we're like, I'm like, okay, I've been, it's been in the back of my head. I'm like, and I just appreciate what you're doing. And I just been really wanting to, to talk to well, you. Well, thanks. Thanks for reaching out, Kelly. Nice to see your face through the internet. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. It's, someday we'll get to do this in person. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Like, or at least hang out again in person. I'm, I'm. Yeah. It's gonna be wonderful when that finally can happen. So. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Just like with. Yeah. Well, you stay safe. You too. Okay. All right. Take care. Bye.